Good evening, and welcome to UFO Line. I'm Gene Huff here with Bob Lazar. Bob, are you set for the show? No. In fact, this is the last place I want to be tonight. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Our guest tonight really needs no introduction in the Las Vegas listening area. He's got a famous family name, and he's made an infamous name for himself in UFO research, and that guest, of course, is John Lear. Welcome, John. Thanks, Gene. So, John, I think uh, a good place to start might be, uh, uh, of all the stories that fly around us, about you and ufology, I think one that... Are we jumping right into this? Right, right. <laughs> one that a lot of people don't know is how did you get interested in ufology? How, how did, what was the catalyst that actually made you pay attention to what's going well, on? Well, you know, my dad was always talking about this stuff. He was, he had seen, made a sighting and uh, um, I'd never been all that much interested because I didn't think there was anything to it. As a matter of fact, 1980, I remember corresponding with uh, John Andrews that, uh, of testers that there was nothing to it. Then in 19, but I'd heard all the stories that all the guys hears. But in 1985, uh, a friend of mine who I flew with uh, in Laos uh, during the Southeast Asian conflict, uh, he flew A-10s. He came to uh, Nellis Air Force Base on his way somewhere, and he came up. He hadn't seen him in about 10 years. And in the conversation, I asked him where all he'd been based and then, since I'd seen him. And one of the places he mentioned was Bentwaters, England. And that's the United States Air Force Base about 70 miles northeast of uh, London. And I said, oh, Bill Waters, well, that's supposedly where that flying saucer crashed in 1980. He said, no, John, not supposedly it did. He said, I didn't see it because I was confined to quarters, but I know the guys who did. And he gave me the names of um, Major Ted Conrad, uh, Colonel Chuck Halt, and uh, General uh, Williams. And I said, what are, you, what are you telling me, that this stuff is true? And he said, yeah, it sure is. And that's what started me off. So I spent the next two years, you know, I thought I had known a lot of secret stuff. I worked on and off for the uh, CIA for many years, and I thought I knew a lot of stuff. But uh, this is one big thing I missed out. So that's what started me. Okay. If anyone would like to give us a call, you can call 731-1230 or hit star twelve thirty on your cell phone. Uh, John, what's the latest? I mean, you're always good for an outrageous prediction. Uh, why don't we get your comments on some of the, the recent happenings? What are your thoughts on the uh, alien autopsy, Phil? Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not real. It's just personal opinion. There's no particular reason, uh, but it doesn't look like uh, uh, a real alien as if I'd seen a real alien before. So you think somebody faked it for money? Uh, could be. I really don't know what the story is. Hmm. Well, Bob has a giant list of past John Lear predictions and statements and accusations that he'd like to go through to see which ones you still stand by and which ones you've changed your mind on. So, Bob, you want to go ahead and hit the list? Sure I do, Dink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let's start at the bottom. The driver shot Kennedy. The driver of the limo shot Kennedy. What do you think about I'm that? I'm not convinced that, uh, still not convinced that uh, he didn't do it. Of course, everybody's dropped it by now, but uh, I went back. But you still think it's possible? It's possible. Mm. I went back and viewed some film that a guy had that was uh, uh, really close up, and he was trying to sell what me on film? The only one was the Zapruder film. Uh, yeah, it was uh, enlarged from one of the supposed second or third, third generation films. With, and he was trying to show me the pink of the driver's hands on the wheel while this supposed shooting scenario was going on. But, but it wasn't all that convincing. Okay. The five, mile square, the five square mile roof over Area 51. Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, Wrong. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's one and one. The two billion aliens living along the mountains or inside the mountains along Highway 93. That was pretty far-fetched. I have to admit that. It's hard to believe that even you said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. i got to say that my favorite one's for last. Uh, the underground tunnel from... Boulder Dam to Area 51. There's underground tunnels all over the place. And, uh, so you think somewhere around the dam you can get in a tunnel and drive to Area 51 underground? At Nellis or anywhere you want. Edwards, uh, George Air Force. You Bridge. can drive from Boulder to Edwards underground? Uh, it's, it's not. I don't think you can drive it. They have these, I think they call them maglev or something. Uh, they got a maglev <laughs> train in there? Yeah. <laughs> You no, must be kidding me. No question, no doubt about it in my mind. As a matter of fact, I talked... And they them. built that without anyone seeing them dig the tunnel. Yeah. What do they do with the dirt and the rock that was... Well, I don't think the they dirt... Hated. I don't. I think it's the process of digging the holes that the, that the dirt is uh, decomposed. There was a... Decomposed uh, the dirt. Okay. 
the uh, uh, patent that I showed you a couple years ago that came that the two uh, uh, Los Alamos guys got for that train or for that digging uh, equipment that that uses the same process. But that would be a major undertaking to construct a you know a maglev train under there. You have no idea how far those things extend. I talked with a guy who works in L.A. with a guy who was worked at Holloman, and he talked. You know, they talked about getting on this maglev and going different places. You know, it's just not out here. It's all over the place. Yeah, I'm going to stick by that one. Okay, don't call Acid Rescue. We're here with John Lair. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to give us a call, dial seven three one one two three zero. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I don't want to say that one yet. What about the uh, people or food for aliens? What about that old kind? Uh, I'll probably stick by that. Yeah, I, I, you're kidding me. Well, not. Yeah, I, I'll have to stick by that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about that little story about? Um, abductees getting these implants and then at some point in time someone's going to have this device that resembles a TV remote control and uh, be able to control these guys all in mass and yeah, whatever they I'll, want. I'll stick by that one. I'm getting scared. Okay. What about um, the stealth fighter? The liquid crystals on the top and bottom of the stealth fighter so from above it looks like the ground and from below it looks like the sky. They didn't use that on the stealth fighter but it may have been used on another airplane. Which airplane was that? Too bad they can't see the, your expression. <laughs> okay. Uh, 70 different species of aliens? 80. 80. There's probably 80 uh, have visited Earth. Okay, well, where where do you get a number like that? From the different drawings that the people have, have made of the different types. All the drawings I've seen, with the exception, yeah, exception, did I say that? <laughs> Is that with a the word? <laughs> with the exception, <laughs> with the exception of uh, the reptilian type guy and the pickle man, the the remainder of them look exactly, uh, essentially the same, exactly like the grade. No, there's books and books and books of all the different types. Okay. John, was that your watch alarm? <laughs> um, the jailer, um, yeah, I guess it was a jail, down somewhere on the Nellis Range to put all the UFO researchers at one point in time. Yeah, if I said that, I was uh, a little bit off base there. But not off base with those other things? No. Okay. Um, now, we're getting into my favorite ones here. Well, not yet. Reptilian, since we mentioned them. There is a reptilian race, and uh, there... Where does this come from? Where did he come from? No, where, I mean, where does this information come from? The reason I bring up reptilians is because at one time I called... You had a UFO drawing somewhere that you showed me, and um, I thought it looked pretty neat and wanted to get a, a print of it, and you said I had a call Bill hamilton or something yeah, like that yeah. and uh you gave me his number i called and got his wife or girlfriend on the phone and she said that bill's not here right now he's down the block uh because uh, one of the neighbors was having some problems with a reptilian and i i thought it was a joke and she was serious and uh, i said well what do you mean and uh she said well he was out hassling her in the front yard now, this always has left an impression with me that these reptilian guys are out walking around hassling people on the street. And Well, that's in California. <laughs> I'm not familiar, or I don't remember that story, but the fact is uh, there is a reptilian race, and uh, they are around, and they don't walk down the streets. Uh, but they're there. They exist. So you think they're an advanced race? Absolutely. Apparently like the greys? And... Way, way ahead of us. Uh, is there any contact with them now? Uh, supposedly at the test site, uh, there has been contact with, uh, with a species called a reptilian. What, that they're w working there in some capacity, or they're just yeah, in captivity? Yeah, they're or? just there. Uh, the story was related to me about a guard uh, who had to be, or guards who had to be shown photos uh, about three to four weeks, just flash photos, 
uh, of these species before they were put on duty so that they weren't sitting there and guarding something and one of these things came walking down the hall and these guys dropped dead of a heart attack uh, seeing this weird looking thing. What would, uh, what, do you, do you have any ideas about the motivations and what is this a, is this a joint venture with humans and the reptilians similar to the old stories about the greys or, or, or exactly what is there? I don't know what the story is. No. I just can't buy that you believe all this stuff. Well, when we first met in the... Uh, I know. In the, I didn't believe in flying saucers. You didn't believe in flying saucers. And, uh, yeah, but still. It's kind of like George Knapp saying, you know, on, uh, in some of his interviews that, that I have gone way overboard. You guys got to remember that I've got about a three or four heads, a year head start on you guys. I guarantee you in three to four years I'm not going to be saying yes to these questions. <laughs> Okay, uh, Venus, nice place to live. <laughs> now, yeah, I know you have trouble with that. I have a lot of trouble with that because there's a sulfuric acid atmosphere. The surface temperature How temperature you know? is close to. Have you been there? No, but probes have gone there from other, our country and other countries, Russia specifically. And, uh, and you don't think we can dock to the information? The whole point of, of why the, would we? What is the big secret? So what if it's habitable? But we don't want you think people to think that we are the only ones. Who who are the people think that? Whoever runs the show here. They want people to think that we are the only people. There couldn't be life on Mars. There couldn't be life on Do you Venus. think there's life on Venus? Probably. Is one of them that lady that shows up to the UFO convention? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. But there's what, what do you think the there. surface temperature is on Venus around the equator? It's probably like Earth. Now, you I know you're gonna like give, I know you're what gonna, about the clouds? I know you're going to give me that stuff about the clouds, and I don't know how it, how it works. And like we say, we're, we're, we're dealing in opinion. You know, I don't have any facts. I haven't been there, and neither uh-huh. do you. <laughs> but that's the famous old Bob Lazar comeback. Have you been there? No, I haven't been there, but neither have you. And you're just taking data that the government sells you on, on what they want you to know. Okay. <laughs> and let's jump into it, because I know you're coming up. Uh, atmosphere. On uh, the moon. And water on the moon. Yeah. Uh, in certain places, there is. There's not a great deal, but there's enough to... Uh, to Do you think there is that three-mile-high or 30-mile-high dome it's a, with that city inside? It's a six-mile-high tower, and I don't know if there's a city inside. It kind of looks like an antenna, but yeah, the heavens is pretty good that it's there. And for those that haven't heard about it, it's in the uh, Hoagland tape, Moon Mars connection. It's about a three hour tape, and he goes through uh, Orbiter, um, uh, Pioneer, and, and a lot of the other uh, data and shows where this tower is. It's right directly in the center of Sinus Medi. And when the moon is full, uh, it's in the direct center of the moon. So do the uh, do the astronauts that orbited and walked on the moon are, are they aware of this and, and staying quiet? Yeah, they are. And I met had dinner with one of the uh, four uh, psychologists that was assigned to the Apollo astronauts, and they assigned them uh, uh, psychologists not so much of the the weird stuff they saw, but the fact that they couldn't tell the public. And that's what bothered all of the astronauts the most. That's what sent uh, Borman overboard and and a few others. They were really bitter at NASA for not being able to uh, to tell the truth about what's going on. Yeah, but strangely enough, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, came out here to visit me. And he was out because he was interested in all the UFO information, so on and so forth. And in fact, he even said that all the astronauts had gotten together and they have kind of a powerful group that they formed. I don't remember what they called it. But... Um, he didn't mention anything along uh, I'm sure that in one day meeting you, he would have told his uh, deepest, darkest secrets that NASA had told him. Yeah, we pointed that out to him also, so you do have a good point there. Okay. Um, i got to look at what I didn't check off here. <laughs> and the final question for that. Well, John, how about this? Uh, what's your what's your current view of the big picture? I mean, now you say we've got reptilians here, where they're lying to us about uh, uh, you know survivable atmospheres and temperatures on the near planet. Uh, uh, what, what do you think the big picture is? I, I can remember, you know, six seven years ago. Not that you were necessarily responsible for it, but. 
But UFO researchers always have something big is going to happen at the end of this year. Yeah. Something big is going to happen. I made that a, was October 92. And I made the mistake of making several predictions. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't do that anymore. I have no idea what to do. Well, you don't need to pre you know, predict a big invasion. I, so what do you think the status is of the big picture? I, I, you know, any impending doom or... Well, the, you, the government guys that I know, uh, all they can say is the next five years are going to be very, very interesting. But we've heard that, you know, for the last 10 years or 20 years, whatever. So it's just kind of nice to just sit back and watch and, and know the stuff that uh, we know to be real uh, uh, and kind of yeah, see what's going on. Real. Well, I'm talking about the stuff you told us, but I assume that's real. <laughs> So, John, what are your thoughts on the land grab out here in Central Nevada? Everyone made a big deal of it. You were among some of the first. You, Jim Goodall, Sean Morton, Gary Schultz, people like that who climbed up and, and viewed down on Area 51. And, and you... Uh, How you, dare you mention John? You, uh, <laughs> in the company with John Lair and Jim Goodall. And, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously you knew that they were keeping photographic logs of, uh, you know, the persistent intruders, and that led to the land grab. What do you think about all the people whining about it when they actually caused the land grab? It's oh, big deal. You know, Area, uh, Area 51 is just one of many areas they've got, you know, and they were smart to, to, to draw the attention there and get people from looking at where, where other stuff is going. Mm -hmm. You want to go ahead and take a call? Sure. Okay, let's go ahead and take one. Go ahead. You're on UFO line. Hello. Hi. How you doing, fellas? Good. All right. Season's greetings. Um, Mr. Lair, I, um, you know, you, I know you've, you've been dealing with this for a while, and, and your father was dealing Did you have a lot of experiences when he was, you know, growing up into the world, into the, the field he was into? Did he get a lot of uh, experiences with seeing, uh, quote, alien craft or unidentified flying objects? That's a good question. What, what he started didn't have a lot of experience. My dad, uh, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with his background, he, he founded Lear Incorporated uh, and was chairman of the board for 30 years. They were a large supplier of uh, components for military aircraft, uh, and he sold this in 1960. He was involved uh, with the government in anti-gravity research from about 1957 to about 1960, 1960 down in Fort Huachuca. Uh, and he had had a couple of sightings and a friend of lots of friends he's had a couple of sightings. It was interesting now that I look back, the people that he used to bring home are people that, you know, were very involved with the cover-up. Cover General uh, Jimmy Doolittle, um, uh, several of those guys that he used to bring home, and he, he was very, he, he knew a lot about it. He got a, a lot of criticism because he went down, uh, I think it was to Bolivia to sell some, uh, uh, aircraft equipment, and he was quoted by the press as saying flying saucers were real, and uh, he got a lot of flack over that. But like I say, I used to talk about it all the time, but it didn't interest me because I'd never seen one, and, and it just I wasn't interested. I was interested in uh, spy planes, the yeah. SR-71 stuff up there. See, I, uh, my father was in the Air Force. He was in there for like 25 years, and I lived here in Las Vegas for roughly about 22 years, 23 years now. And um, I've had experiences. They flew out to the Air Force Base and back when that area was really just, really was not much around there. You know how bad it is now, how much it's grown over there. Yeah. And um, I've had some experiences out there, like in, in the, out in the Valley of Fire and stuff. I've had some experiences. And I had to go come to the hospital and everything. This is the, the military hospital up there. They kept me up there for like five days and, and you know, taking tests on me and doing, doing whatnot on me to find out what happened. And I know that when I came out of, when I came back, my parents came to pick me up from up there. My parents forgot all about it, didn't know anything about what happened. And so it's just like, I, I feel, to me, it feels as the government went and did something with them to keep them from remembering it. But I mean, it was clear as a bell. Father was really a concern at that point in time when it first happened. But after that, it's like they, they don't know it. They don't remember anything about it. Yeah, they have a very good way, the government does, of uh, erasing people's memories. It's it's uh, very good. I talked to a, a lady a, a couple of months ago who was with the Air Force and stationed at uh, Toronto Park Test Range between 1970 and 1981, and her memory for that whole time is just, I mean, there's nothing there. She has, uh, you know, flashes of weird stuff going on, but no real memory. Really nice lady. 
think they might have died. Do you know how they go about doing that? No, I sure don't. I think that's something we should find out. Because the, the, if a person could open up everything that, that you know, quote the government to them from the me, you know, from the memory, you can just you can just barely scratch the surface of 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 how bad the defeat the government is performing to everyone, you know. You know, it's a shame to say that it's not I love America. I would rather be here than any place else in the world, but you know, it's a shame that there are those people that are that are here that are doing these things to America and to Americans. Yeah, well, uh, I agree with you, but I don't think there's much hope of uh, ever bringing this out. That's like that's like finding who's the person that, you know, or at least bringing the person who really killed Kennedy to justice. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's too late for that. The yeah. same that Oswald had to be a bad thing, right? Yeah, way too late. Way okay. too late. Well, yeah, but I'm sure you probably already know who, you already have your, your suspicions on who was that did it, don't, don't you? What were they? Oh, I bet you already have your suspicions on who was the person. John, John suspects the uh, driver of well, the limo shot. I'm, I'm just saying I'm not ruling the driver out. <laughs> well, um, a friend of mine, his father, was one of the um, secret service men in the, the head back to the government for the president back then. And if you look at the Bruder film, you can see him. He's one of the guys that's on the side of the road. Is that right? Yeah, and um, you know how like when people do a little bit of drinking, they tell you about a lot of things yeah. you know, that they're not supposed to talk about? Right. And um, then you know how they confiscated a lot of that film. Um, he had a film, he had some film, and he put it on. He went to look at it. Now um, he told us times and dates and everything of how they uh, how they were planning on having him assassinated. And even twelve days prior to that, they were going to assassinate him. You know, they changed the whole route. Oh yeah, there's no question about that. For that case, and I actually from the position I saw it, at, I actually saw the the fatal shot on fire from the front. I think the curious thing about the Spruder film is the very, what is it, seven seconds or whatever you generally get to see, and, and all of the shots before the president got there, uh, all the shots of the grassy knoll of, of everywhere, just general area shots, someone has that somewhere. It, it preceded all of that on the film, and that's what... Well, what was that photographed? Do we know that? Well, the oh, yeah, there was the Pruder film taken before the little clip you see of Kennedy. Of the grass, you know, and around the general area. Uh, I think I saw that on Arts and Entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That, that I, didn't know, a, I didn't know that was actually photographed by him. Yeah, I saw the I saw the one we were talking about, too, about the driver. Um, Bill was his name. And I know his last name and stuff like that, but he's dead now. And like I said, it wouldn't make a difference now because he's not going to be going to, he's not going to be brought to trial. And is he dead? I thought he was alive and living in Georgia or something. Like no, that. I he died. Yeah, he just he was he died he sometime died. within uh, since ninety one, ninety ninety one, I think. Mysteriously, from what I've heard. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for the call. And thank you for taking the time, and I sure hope to hear you guys show again. Maybe they can extend it to, uh, to two hours. Oh, I hope not. That's yeah, hard earlier. <laughs> they need to give you guys a lot more publicity, because it's, I, think, I don't think that they're advertising for you guys correctly. I think that just like... Well, that's, that's kind of our fault. We really don't even feel like coming down there. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's a casual that. thing, but thanks for the call. Yeah, yeah thanks for calling. Care. And may you guys never sleep under Rudolph with the post naval drip. All right. I hate that when that happens. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Bye-bye. I missed that. All right, what's the difference? Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, if you'd like to give us a call, the number seven three one one two three zero, and uh, if you're on a cell phone, you can hit star 1230 if you'd like to ask John Lear, Bob Lazar, or uh, any of us any questions. John, uh, you, you know, you're somewhat of a central hub. You, you're a, you're a high-profile guy, and a lot of people approach you to tell you stories about being abducted. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of people even approach you that work at Nellis Air Force Base and other places. I Can I presume that you conclude by now that not all of these people can be crazy and not all of them are searching for attention? I mean, you've yeah, seen, that's, that's, you've seen uh, a number of people. What about, we get asked all the time about uh, whatever happened to John Grace, the guy that wrote those... Uh, Vladimir Valerian. Valerian. Whatever. Vladimir moved to Oregon, and uh, he has a real nice uh, business going. He still writes that, what, uh, I forget what the name of his magazine was, but uh, he, he's doing well. What did he do for Nellis? Didn't he work for Nellis? Yeah, he was a tech sergeant, and uh, he worked in, I'm trying to think, it's been so long ago. I, I was over to his office a couple times. Huh. Well, how about the Area 51 report? Oh, the Area 51 report. This is going to be a weekly thing. 
Well, boy, there's so much stuff going on. First of all, up at Groom, we have two new proof of concepts ready to fly. One will fly next week and the other around March, and both are very, very fast. And you remember that helicopter we built about 10 years ago that could carry around 250 troops? Now we have one that can carry 600 fully armed combat grid uh, troops. And over at Sandia, they have that new, uh, remember Sandia, that new base they built over there on Paiute Mesa. They have a new computer that is a billion times faster than the fastest in commercial use today. A billion. Hey, do you know uh, who invented the Internet? It was DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and they did it in 1967. What they foresaw was the exponential use of the personal computer and saw the Internet as a direct way into homes, hearts, and minds of the public. This computer up at Sandia can track what anybody ever wrote or said or wherever anybody ever went on the Internet with their PC. And not only that, whether your PC is on or not, they can access your hard drive anytime they want. And hey, what's going on at, at uh, Tonopar? We have the new counterinsurgency airplane that's being used out at uh, Aviano in the uh, Bosnian conflict. The security is so tied up at TTR that now they have three fences instead of one, and the entire support team, which consists of about 350 people, are billeted right out the flight line instead of back down at the uh, gate, like when the F-117 came out. And speaking of the 117A, whatever happened to the F-19? The F-19 went down the Skunk Works uh, assembly line right next to the 117, used the same engines, 404s, but was a Navy bird and was a Batwing-type aircraft. They made about 60 of them. It turns out that the F-117A was just a cover for this other high-tecker. And whoa, what's flying out of the Northern Nevada secret facility? It's black and it's fast. All you can see at night is a contrail, which looks like a green neon tube about a mile long. They've been doing some low-altitude work around Idaho between midnight and 4 a.m. That dude really gets along about four or 5,000 miles an hour at low altitude. And flying saucers? Apparently the aliens can't fly any better now than they could in 1947 because we recovered two of them in the past year right here in Nevada. One came down between the dam and Kingman about a month or so ago and one in northern Nevada last year. And that's it for the test site update. For Friday, December 22nd, 1995, this is John Lear and Bob Lazar wishing all of you at Get One, and hey, don't want to forget you guys over at Station 9, a very Merry Christmas. Bob? <laughs> <laughs> now, who can argue with that? You're right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, i got to jump on the computer. Um, let me see that little sheet of paper. They can access your hard drive in a PC, whether or not your computer's on. Yeah, hard to believe. Oh, huh? Yeah, about as hard as you can get. <laughs> now, exactly how would they manage to feet like that? Uh, well, I don't know. Aside, <laughs> aside from them coming over and turning it on. All right? I'm telling you is the, uh, you know, what I, uh, what I heard. From where did you hear that? Bill Cooper. <laughs> Good old Bill. He takes a lot of flack, but you know, he, we we named the disease that Bill Cooper got that, that many of us got it was called the UFO disease. Right. That. And the UFO disease, when you start out in this business, and and uh, you hear you know and see some stuff that that really happens, real real, but uh, you start adding on to it, and and like Bill, he just he just got too far out. He started taking stuff that I had in my files. Oh, and he read that in the yeah. And that's my favorite story. In fact, maybe you should, you know, please our audience and tell them the story about O.H. Krill. Uh, that O.H. Krill was a name that you and John Grace had, had given to Yeah, for the people that don't know who O.H. Krill was, that uh, John Grace, who then worked for the Air Force, uh, wrote a, a treatise or something on aliens that he wanted to, to felt the public should know, and I forget what it was all about, but he didn't want to put his name, so he said, well, why can we... Uh, Whose name can we use? And I said, well, you know, the Navy had an incident um, that uh, they supposedly contacted an, an alien in the late 50s, and the name was Krill, C or K R L L L. Why don't we uh, call uh, this guy Krill, K R I L L, and it'll be just kind of an inside joke. And so John says, okay, and uh, how about some initials? And I said, I don't know, pick one. And he said, oh, O H. So then, uh, John. Which stood for it. only hostage or something. Original, like that. Hostage. original hostage, yeah. Well, that wasn't our intent. It was, it was just picked out of the. Oh, air. was it? Okay. And then when Bill Cooper got a hold of this story, uh, he had seen that in in the Navy, and the O H stood for original hostage, and we just picked those initials out of the air. You're <laughs> right, and he had read that whole report when yeah, he was there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So about this uh, flying disc that they what it there was an 
an alien piloted flying disc that crashed between Boulder Dam and Kingman in the last month? Supposedly, that's what I mean. Uh, and uh, what, was it able to fly away, or did someone have to go pick it up? No, and supposedly it there was some staged uh, chemical accident or road accident or something where people were diverted from the dam. Uh, for a day or so, so that they could recover that. Thing. Oh, that's what that story was behind that spill down there. And was there was there really a spill? Well, they did close. I remember in the, in recent months they did close the dam up. Somebody told me that, and I remember down through Laughlin and Searchlight. I remember that there was an accident with with uh, some uh, Taiwanese or something, but I didn't remember a spill. And when the guy told me this story, I was trying to think. No, I didn't remember a spill. Hmm. Now, where was the other crash? You said there were two of them. Supposedly, supposedly in northern Nevada. Oh. And and why do you think it is that these things uh, crash, that you, especially if the, I'm presuming these are, are capable of interstellar travel, or are they some type of scout ships out of a mothership? I'm just curious as to why they would be able to fly here from another star system and then crash so routinely. That question is asked a lot, you know, a lot of times. I don't know. I don't know why they crash. Hmm. Maybe they don't get enough simulator training. <laughs> Boy, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it's so hard for me to digest this. I mean, I can understand. Well, I'm not even going to start a fight. So, are you? Uh, Go ahead. We'll uh, we'll we'll start it here, and we can <laughs> end it up in the area that you went by. So, have you uh, have you been walking back into the general UFO community? I remember it wasn't in the early '90s that they tried to ban you from the MUFON convention here in Las Vegas. Yeah, I hosted the MUFON yeah, didn't convention. Didn't some guy quit because you? Were, yeah, you yeah, know? a couple guys quit MUFON and. Uh, I hosted the MUFON convention here in 1989, I guess it was, and uh, it was, it was, it was uh, real popular, but uh, I kind of was disinvited. I couldn't speak at my own uh, uh, hosted uh, convention, and I did a little talking all through 91, 92, but it cost me two good jobs, so uh, I quit talking about UFOs at, at all. The, the one job was uh, American Trans Air. I was a captain there for uh, six years. And they hauled me in one day, and they said, you don't actually believe in flying saucers, do you? And I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And they said, well, we can't have anybody working here flying passengers and believe that. So I lost that one. Then the next one I had was uh, with Orbital Sciences, and uh, Orbital Sciences operates the L-1011 that carries the Pegasus rocket that, uh, that launches payloads uh, into uh, space. And uh, I was hired as a project pilot, and the uh, senior project manager called me up one day and said, John, we applied for your clearance, and I don't know what you've done, but neither the U.S. Air Force or NASA uh, wants you on this program. So that was the second job. So I kind of lie pretty low now. Mm -hmm. You don't need to pay those bills, huh? Absolutely. Um, so, listen, let's, you've been around, certainly involved with ufology, long, as long as just about anyone. You've seen the personalities... Uh, Evolve, unfold, and even change. So maybe we could go down the line here and hear some gossip and uh, exactly what your thoughts are on these people, how they started off, and what their stance is now. For instance, let's start off with Stanton Friedman. My buddy, Stanton. Uh, obviously, Stanton Friedman did a lot of good things. Um, uh, he went to bat, certainly believes that the, the earth is being visited by life from elsewhere. Uh, specializes in the old-fashioned MUFON stuff. Here's some crossed out Freedom of Information Act documents, blah, blah, blah. In recent days on the Internet, I've seen a lot of criticism of Friedman that uh, out somewhere he won't answer questions for people unless they buy one of his books, and, and he signs it, and, and people have attributed some sort of a change in his personality. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, I haven't talked to Stan in many years. Uh, I uh, really thought he did a good job uh, as far as he went. What turned me off to Stan Freeman is that when uh, Bob came out and talked to, about working at the test site and Stanton was in town uh, just about the time this was all going on up at my house and he didn't even make the slightest you know, request to meet Bob or talk to him and I wondered, here's the supposed premier UFO researcher of the century and he doesn't even want to talk to Bob so it kind of turned me off to Stan. Okay, you want to go ahead and take another call? Sure. Let's go ahead. Go ahead, you're on UFO line. Yes, good evening, John. Good evening, Bob. Is Gene up there? Yes. Well, good evening, Gene. Good evening. Yeah, greetings from uh, the Billy Goodman Happening. Uh, from I'm the Billy not, Goodman Happening. I'm not there, but uh, Billy's going to be uh, listening to this tape shortly. And well, how you doing, Billy? Right. Actually, the reason we decided to do this show is we missed the old Billy Goodman show here in town and, uh, and tried to get some late-night talk going. Well, you're doing an exceptional job, and I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, Bob, the last time that you spoke 
uh, on the air was on the happening, as far as I know. Remember? Probably so. Probably so. Yeah. Yeah, the old Vegas world. Right. Yeah, that's right. All oh, right. Yeah, we, we were... had an afternoon show there for a, uh-huh. for a short time. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to give you my guard. Okay. Uh, regard. Is uh, is Billy doing a UF? Is the uh, scientific spiritual happening still still going? Oh, uh, he's doing a show back uh, out of Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, uh, he's still up there. Uh, three to five, or no, three to six every afternoon, mm-hmm. five days a week. Uh, WSUB out of Connecticut actually is where the uh, station is at right now. Mm-hmm. Well, Billy's a great host, and he was always a good time. And I, people criticized him because he let anything go, but uh, you know that that provided for a fun show as he didn't pass judgment on everyone, like yeah. we're just getting ready to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, the last time I saw you was over there at uh, El Dorado High School. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, of course, Bob came out that night, and it was nice. Not to see willingly, you. of course. <laughs> no, of course not willingly, but at, at least it, it was nice to see you both together. So, uh, Merry Christmas and season's greetings to you and everyone else. All right, thanks for the call. Say hi to Billy for us. Okay, I will. Okay, uh, he'll hear this. Okay, right. Bye. Bye. Hey, I did want to tell you uh, or cover one thing. Uh, I think I told you both as. Uh, south of town here meeting a guy on some business and this guy grew up in New Mexico just about 60 miles north of Farmington about 70 years old and we get to talk and we're talking about you know something totally unrelated uh, uh, with UFOs and in the conversation he said that he was a, uh, a uh, roughneck on a, uh, for working for El Paso Natural Gas and he started talking about seeing this thing land and, and I said what year was that and he said uh, 1948 and he starts talking about a disc and I realize I'm talking to one of the only guys that's ever come forward uh, that was at the crash at Aztec. Now, you know that Bill Steinman wrote the book Crash at Aztec, and it's been uh, thoroughly discredited by Bill Moore and all those guys. But there is a lot of good information, and uh, I always believed it to be real, but I never met anybody who actually saw it. This guy was one of five workers at El Paso Natural Gas that were standing there in Hart Canyon when this thing crashed. It was 100 feet in diameter. Um, it had a small hole in one of the windows that they could peek in and see there was four aliens on the main deck and apparently there was some on a lower deck and they were there for five hours before the military got there and rounded them up and uh, and swarmed to secrecy and all that and this guy has never told anybody the story in, in all these years he's 70 years old now but it was pretty interesting I went home I talked to him first uh, and I tried to see if maybe he'd read Bill Steinman's book, but no, he hadn't. So I went home and got the book and brought it back, and he read it for a couple of days, and then I came back and interviewed him, and, he, and there's, of course, there's some maps and drawings in Bill Steinman's book, and he told me what was true and, and what was false. There was a picture of a pole being poked through uh, this hole in the window to catch the latch and open the door, and he said the pole in the book is much too big. It was a thin rod that came off one of the welding trucks with uh, El Paso natural gas. He also, th- also uh, in Bill Steinman's book, it said helicopters came there. And he said when I was there, there was no helicopters. But he said it was uh, it was really an interesting experience that he never told anybody about it. And it was kind of neat to uh, to meet the guy. How was that covered up? I mean, something 100 feet in diameter, I imagine people saw that inbound, so on and so forth. Well, and, uh, they must remote, have had a cover story. For it was them. such a remote area. I mean, nobody, there weren't that many people around there. This was just, you know, an Aztec, New Mexico. Yeah, I'm not familiar with where that is. Well, it's east of Farmington, and it's, uh, it's a very desolate area. Farmington, if I remember, is almost on the edge of the state. The police chief it. was one of the guys that uh, was there, uh, and... They briefed him on secrecy. He was later uh, given a job in Long Beach as the uh, police uh, chief there for 20 years and then moved back to Farmington. And uh, Bill Steinman interviewed him, and he just refused to talk about, you know, just even refused to, to discuss the incident. So that, that brings to mind uh, <laughs> what I just <laughs> forgot. And What's that other one? his mind at the same time. <laughs> right. Just, you, you, Dulcie, you, you, Dulcie. Okay. No, just, what are your your uh, current views on that? Do you still think that there is an underground base in Dulce? Uh, Absolutely. You know what story I'm referring to. Absolutely. Absolutely. The guy that got out of there and the, the, the vats of amber-colored liquid. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, I have, uh, Why? You know that you, there have been plenty of people gone up there snooping around. Oh, yeah, and there's no signs there saying secret underground base. And the Indians no, of course not, but I mean, they've... 
you know, covered the mountains. I, these guys were UFO enthusiasts like yourself, and they were, you know, would have been more than happy to, more than happy to find anything. I mean, they didn't find any event, any even ground disturbance. Well, anything. did you see any of the any of the work that Jim Delatoso did? No. Well, he he spent six weeks there with real sensitive uh, re, uh, monitors, recording monitors, and they monitored kind of all monitors? all kinds of uh, power and stuff being generated around there. You know, it's been four. So they measure electromagnetic emissions. Is that it's, uh, yeah? And it's been four or five years since they talked about this, so I don't have a lot of this stuff over off the top of my head. But uh, it was a it was a very good videotape on. What was going on in Dulce? And the Do you think is, anything is still there or if it's still in sure. existence? Yeah, sure. Uh, the Air Force guy that I know that was there refers to it not as Dulce, but I think he called it Section D. What uh, about uh, the guy from Los Alamos, whose name I can't remember either? My memory is so fantastic. The guy we both know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we better not mention his name because he works up at Tessa. Well, um, was that his name, Tom? Uh, we called him Poofon or something, yeah. 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 I know you were Wasn't he a preacher? Yeah. Yeah, because you started insulting Jesus and everything, and then... Uh, I did not, not do that this near his birthday, Jesus. okay? <laughs> John, you, you brought up Bill Moore before, and uh, Bill Moore always seems to take it personally upon himself, uh, even if it's transparent, to try and discredit anything that he has not sponsored or anything he has not approved yet. I remember George Knapp and I met with him a... Uh, a few years ago when he came up here and and uh, Moore said that he didn't believe Bob Lazar's story but he had some information that actually there were there was an alien settlement out in central Nevada before the white man moved west and we made jokes about how surprised the pioneers must have been when they came over, right, you know, over like in the wagon, covered right. wagon like a Twilight Zone episode and there was a flying good space there but what do you think Bill Moore is up to why do you think he feels compelled to try and squelch anything that that surfaces that he is not sponsored. I think it goes back to the cover-up where everybody thinks the Air Force is in charge. They're not. It was the Navy. The Navy's always been in charge of the uh, cover-up, and they used the Air Force as a whipping boy. Now, the Air Force, uh, what Bill Moore got hooked up with was AFOSI, uh, the Air, Por uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and what they were trying to find, they themselves wanted to know what was going on. Uh, so they enlisted Bill to pass around, you know, some good information, some disinformation to ferret out uh, the truth. And I think he got mixed up with AF AFOSI, and they don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. What was the the uh, disinformation that Bill Moore spread around? Uh, he claims to have uh, fabricated the the Benowitz deal and Dulce and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Fabricated the Benowitz deal. Yeah. He was the one that supposedly fed Benowitz the information on Dulcie. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, as we march down the UFO gossip list, now, what do you think of Linda Howe? I thought, uh, I think A Strange Harvest still stands. When did it came out in 1979 or 1980? That was and, very good. And it was a great film, and it was down to earth, and, and lately she's been called every name in the book because she has gotten UFO researcher syndrome and spread out, and now she's speaks her mind on crop circles and, and numerous other areas as pretty much a correspondent. Do you think that uh, that Linda has degenerated or deteriorated as a credible info? I haven't heard what Linda said in the past year. Yeah, uh, a, a big deal about uh, an asteroid running into the Earth. Yeah, I remember it. That was about four years ago. Because that's when we started calling her chicken little. Yeah, on the Internet I read uh, that she was on the some other radio show here in town and uh, played an audio tape of a crowd of people running from Bigfoot. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it happened. Oh, that's right. She's on, uh, it's she on that other uh, Art Bell show. I, I don't know. I've never heard it, but I just see people talking about it on the Internet. And, and uh, Yeah, I haven't heard. But, but Strange Harvest, both the book and the... Uh, Gotten after and and uh, and uh, criticized, and this guy comes on, Bill Cooper, and he says, "I can't vouch for all of what Lear says, but I can vouch for 50 percent of what he says because I saw it in the Navy." So I got invited Bill up, and I talked to him. And he said, "Yeah, I worked uh, in the office of Pearl Harbor," and he said, "I was uh, the." Uh, help the briefing team get out the projector now later he became part of the briefing team but all he was was the guy that brought the projector uh, up and he said he had keys to the safe and he would sit at night and read these documents and that's you know where he originally came up with a lot of his stuff 
So we talked for a while, and unfortunately, I think I contributed to his downfall because I gave him copies of all my research stuff that I had collected. And pretty soon, not maybe a month or two later, not only could he vouch for 50% uh, of what I said, he could now vouch for 150% of what I was saying. And uh, it just went from there. It just got so far out that uh, it was ridiculous. But Bill Cooper did start out, and he honestly did see those papers in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if I remember correctly, amongst those papers, he said he saw documents about that, that the military was actually involved in the Kennedy assassination. Now, they may have been about involved, but I find it difficult to believe that there would be any hard copy uh, alluding to that laying around that a chief petty officer could get in and read. Uh, don't you find that hard to believe? Uh, yeah, but as he told me the story, he had the keys to say for all this was, was locked up. And, and I, think, I think the Kennedy thing was one of the things that he vouched for before uh, all this rest of the information got mixed up. In. And I am sitting here with two imposters. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are never this nice off the radio. I was just dumbfounded. Listen, we got to talk about something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Cooper was the assistant to the commander of the Pacific Fleet. Do I remember that? Uh, you know, it's been six years since I talked about that. The first time Cooper said anything, or the only thing I ever heard him say directly, was at your house, John. And and uh, the only thing he had claimed at that time was that he was on a ship and saw a UFO come out of the water, yeah. tumbling into the sky, and that and that was it. And later, it came tumbling back down to the water. And two years later, that object had become the size of two aircraft carriers. Right. But, uh... It was that big. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, who else did we gossip about? Let's go down the list. Tim Good, I have not, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about Tim Good. He's a... John will say something bad about Tim Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Tim Good was, was a good friend. I saw him a couple times in England. He came out here. I drove him up to the test site with his girlfriend who smoked in the back of the van when she wasn't close to it. And, uh, you know, uh, showed him a hospitality. When he wrote that book, he, he wrote two things that were really dishonest. He said, uh, John Private Lee admitted to me that two of his sources had turned out to be bogus. And I said, you know, who would those two sources be? Uh, Tim, and he said, well, one is Bill Cooper. I said, Bill Cooper was never my source. I was his source. You know, and the other one was, uh, he said, Benowitz. And I said, I never thought that Benowitz was wrong. I always thought that Benowitz was correct about the stuff he's, he talked about. It. So he promised to retract it in his next, the next book, and he never did. So I'm still a little uh, ticked off at uh, Tim Good. So what do you think of the uh, the push nowadays? You know, they had the uh, the budget office investigating the uh, Roswell crash, and it seems to me that that the uh, opponents of the Roswell crash are a lot more vociferous nowadays. Now that Jeffy Marcel is dead, they walk on his grave. They act like he's an idiot, a moron that he wouldn't have known what was going on. I'm specifically speaking of the Project Mogul balloon yeah. uh, story. Uh, don't you think that they're going way overboard and trying to discredit Jesse Marcel's in, in intelligence? Yeah, but the thing is, and, and here I go making another prediction, I don't think we're ever going to know the truth. I, I don't think it's in the cards ever. Uh, every once in a while you hear, uh, like I just heard the other day, oh yeah, April, April's going to be it, they're going to start releasing information. I don't think that they ever intend to tell anybody, because the problem is the first little bit of information will lead to more, and then people are going to want to know more and more, and they can't tell them the whole story. And and why is that? Well, what do you think that it, yeah, the top two or three determining factors are? I, I mean, I, I think we're beyond... Uh, the point where they think people will go crazy, I think that there's nothing to do that. It has to do with religion. And the fact is that religion is the fabric that holds society together. People fear a God, fear that if you do something bad, there will be retribution. Um, if you were to uh, remove this religious factor, uh, they think that society would start breaking down. Uh, if the first thing comes out like, oh yes, we we uh, we recover saucer, it's from somewhere, but uh, we don't know where. People are going to start, you know, questioning whether uh, God is real, that kind of thing. And I think that's what they don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that if that would be the case. Well, well I always, you know, they can always claim that God made the aliens too. I always contend that ufology and, and theology collide head on, and the bottom line is that no one can be elected president of the United States 
since they say they don't believe in the stereotypical Christian Judeo God. It's right. in God we trust on our money. That's right. And, and so, do you remember when that was put on? No, no. 1962. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't old enough to have any money yet then. Is that right? Yeah. What did it say? Oh, it said silver certificate yeah. before that, didn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. In God we trust in this program. Right. And uh, so anyway, I, I think that's the battle no one wants to wage. I mean, there's no sense in it. I think the real question is when we see someone like George Bush or Bill Clinton, I don't know who knows what, when we see them go to church on television, I'm curious if that's just for show and they're playing to the Bible. Yeah, it would be really interesting. Hmm. So let's see. We need some more U.S. Well, gossip names. Well, we're picking up gossip names. Let me show you this picture of... Uh, Hold it up so the viewers can see. All right, Area 51. Ooh, this is Five yeah. Two just sent it to me, and I got it for Christmas. And this was taken in September of 1965. And these are the 2A-12 hangers, and this is the YF-12 hanger. And this was the support aircraft. They had F-101Ds and F-104s chasing the, uh, the airplane during the test program. These are the U-2 hangers right here, and that's maintenance. And this is the old Broom Lake Control Tower. See that little bitty thing right there? And that was the fire station right next to it. And those are the barracks. And that, further that way, uh, they called Baja. And that's where they kept the, uh, the eight, um, A-12 uh, hangers there. The I forgot. What's the difference between the YF-12 and the SR-71? Wasn't one, it the was eight, the nose, right? The, yeah. The A-12 right? was, the, was the CIA bird. And that was a single place one. And then when the Air Force, when SAC found out that the CIA was flying their own spy plane, they went to the Pentagon and said, hey, this can't happen. We're supposed to fly spy missions. So they had Lockheed build a proof of concept, which is a two-place A-12, which became the YF-12A, and they built three of those. And then they built about uh, 35 SR-71s, and the Air Force threw it on. Unbeknownst to the Air Force, the CIA kept flying them uh, on uh, their mission. Hmm. Well, we're about... Uh, well, wait, I think we, we want to take one more call. Let's go ahead and take a call before we get out there. Go ahead, John. You're a whole line. Hi. Uh, I called in last week, and I just heard you guys talking about the uh, YF-12 and SR-71 differences. One thing I'd like to point out on the air that I've never heard anyone really discuss a lot about these aircraft is that the uh, YF-12A carried four huge long-range nuclear-tipped missiles. Yeah, they sure do. And... Uh, the, the Air Force was constantly trying to justify this in front, of Congress, in front of Congress. And my theory has always been that this aircraft was specifically designed to intercept UFOs at high altitudes. And the reason for this is because of the pulse Doppler radar system that that aircraft carried, which would give a false signature to any aircraft that it was scanning to fire missiles at. And this was something that was totally unnecessary going up against Soviet aircraft of the time because none of the Soviet aircraft of the time had radar warning detectors that could tell where a plane was radar scanning it from. That's interesting. I never heard that one before. And the uh, YF-12A also carried uh, cameras which were mounted below the engines on either side which were designed for air-to-air -air photography because the cameras pointed forward and rearward whereas the spy version had cameras mounted where the missiles were pointing downward to take photographs of land. Right. And it's always been my theory that the idea was to intercept the UFOs because this thing could travel at Mach 3 and UFOs could generally have bursts of speed up to Mach 4 from a sudden stop. And this was our best hope at the time of using something to do this because there was just nothing else available to even attempt it. What would make you think that uh, UFOs would be vulnerable to missile attack? Well, if you used a pulse Doppler radar system and you were scanning them, they wouldn't be able to tell exactly where you were scanning them from. And if you fired a missile, and if the missile was going at Mach 4, which it had to because the plane was traveling at Mach 3... You're assuming that the, the craft are flying conventionally. Right if they're just hovering there. They would, it would be a stroke of luck. This is what they would be hoping for. You've you, you got to realize that this was the best they could do. Hmm. So now that's that's the first I've ever heard I'm of. I'm going to check with Spy 2 on those uh, cameras. Where were they mounted? Down the well, there were two camera pods, one mounted under each engine, okay? And they also had uh, radiation sniffers mounted with them and different things that could detect anomalies. Huh. We'll check that out. And the uh, the cameras were mounted 
below the engines on pots with uh, one camera facing forward and one facing rearward. Well, I'll check that out. All right. Um, I also wanted to ask Bob Lazar real quick about the electromagnetic pulse effect from the disc craft. Um, are these, is this done with a separate generator unit inside the craft, or is it all connected to the main power unit, or? It's all connected to the main power unit. The, uh, the amplifier, the, the amplifiers are pulsed uh, 10 microseconds apart. And uh, that's, if you're referring to the pulse, I mean, the, the reach turned on so, sequentially like So that's not a separate self defense unit that can be removed no, no, no. from the craft. It's, it's part oh, of the, the way the craft unit. works. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just a side effect of the way the craft works. Exactly. I see. Um, I also have information concerning a new warhead that the United States Air Force is putting on the new advanced cruise missile, which is an electromagnetic pulse warhead. This came out in an issue of... Uh, I have the magazine around here somewhere. Well, any nuclear warhead will produce an electromagnetic Well, yes, but this does it without a nuclear charge. This does it using an electromagnetic coil and a small explosive charge just enough to destroy the missile. The idea is that this thing will produce such a massive electromagnetic pulse that it would, you know, be used against uh, headquarters installations, uh, financial targets where you want to disrupt money systems. How how on how on earth do they achieve that? I don't know, but it's been published in a magazine. Here it is. Here's the article. It's in fact. But what uh, magazine is it in? It's in an, an issue from uh, July August 1993 Journal of Military Aviation, Volume Two, Number Four, and uh, it, it has a special thing in here on the upgrades on the B-52, hmm. and it says a recent addition to the ALCM is the so-called non-lethal or disabling warheads, which are well suited for regional or low-intensity conflicts. The Air Force has disclosed the development of a non-nuclear electromagnetic pulse generator. An EMP burst is generated by creating a magnetic field in a coil and then compressing it via conventional explosives. Okay, well, thank you for the info. We have to end your phone line for the night, but thanks for the call and give us a call another time. We'd like to thank everybody for listening and thank our guest, John Lear. John, I hope you'll come join us again. Thanks, you will, John. And uh, we'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. We will. <laughs>